So I'm going to talk about uh, using QEMU uh, to speed up your kernel development cycle and uh, also some of the features that QEMU gives you that allow you to actually do things that are a pain or frustrating to do with real hardware. Um, let me just full screen this one second. So I was really glad to see that Greg mentioned that uh, Project Ara, for example, they're using a QEMU image. Um, so for a lot, of, a lot of projects are using QEMU. Some of you may be using it today already, be familiar with it. Um, I'm going to go through the kernel development cycle, um, so what, what the challenges there are, uh, and then I'm going to introduce QEMU and talk about how you can use it to test your kernels, uh, but also how to do more advanced things like uh, device bring up. Uh, if you're just developing drivers for new devices that are um, under development, there's some useful things you can do there. Uh, also error injection techniques, things that are hard to do with real hardware, but easy to do when you have emulated hardware using QEMU. Uh, and I'll also touch on how to debug virtual machines, because you have a lot more power to just inspect the contents of a, a virtual machine. Um, although you can do some of that with hardware, with JTAG and things like that. Um, doing it in software is easy. A, a little bit about me. Uh, I've been working on QEMU uh, for a couple of years. Um, I'm active in the community, so I work in Red Hat's virtualization team. So that's kind of my day job side, uh, working on QEMU and KVM. Uh, but also in my spare time, I do things like uh, the QEMU Advent Calendar, which is a, a cool thing we did this year, where we, we had uh, an interesting or fun uh, disk image every day leading up to Christmas, uh, just showcasing cool hacks, niche operating systems, fun things you can run under QEMU. So Check that out if you get bored. <laughs> and don't break the Wi-Fi. <laughs> um, OK, so I'm an occasional kernel pa patch contributor. Uh, basically, I've, I've contributed to a couple of drivers. Uh, and this is really where my experience comes from, from using QEMU for kernel development. Uh, and that's where, where, where these ideas in this presentation are from. So let's talk about the kernel development cycle. So you write some code. Um, probably you're working on some kernel module. Um, you build it, and, and then at that point you want to test what you've done. You want to run it. So in order to deploy it, you might just load the module um, and then exercise that device or that piece of software that you've added. Um, or you might boot into your new kernel. You might build a whole new kernel, boot your system into it, and then test it. Um, and of course, with development cycles, it's important to, to be able to go back and forth between these stages quickly um, in order to have kind of a, an effective development environment and experience. Because if it's slow and painful to go between these steps, then obviously you, you can't iterate very quickly. And whenever you make a mistake and you have to go back, you lose a lot of time uh, and it interrupts your flow. Um, and I guess a lot of people probably here know this from if you download a brand new kernel from source and now you need to build it, it takes some time to build it. Of course, there are ways to, to improve that. But what this presentation is really about is how can we deploy uh, in a virtual machine? And then what does that allow us to do? What are the neat things we can do uh, by using QEMU? OK, so what are the challenges with, um, uh, with kernel development cycle? So, if you're, if you're developing, these are just a bunch of random subsystems and ideas that I, that I threw in the slide. Um, if you're working on one of these things, you might be familiar with challenges like um, if you just choose to load your kernel module that you're developing on, say you're working on a driver, um, and you just choose to load it right uh, on the machine that you're actually working on and developing your code in, you have your text editor running, you might have a browser up. Obviously, if you, if you hit a, a crash or something, um, that can be very painful. It may not bring down your system. It may be something like the, uh, the kernel module reference count has leaked, and now you can't reinsert the module, so you're going to have to reboot. And these kinds of things interrupt your, your flow. So very quickly, I think people hit this problem and decide, okay, maybe it's not a good idea to be hacking on the kernel that I'm using, my text editor and my compiler and all of that, because otherwise you lose work. Um, there are also some related things. There's KGDB. Uh, there's kdump, mechanisms for crash dumping and for debugging a live kernel. And what they share with this is that they are actually running in the system that you're, you're investigating. Uh, 
Um, and they try to insulate themselves and they try to not use too much kernel infrastructure because obviously if something is very broken, um, then the debugging mechanism itself will also not work if, if, if there's some memory corruption or whatever. So they try to insulate themselves, but there's no way to make them 100% reliable because they're running inside the broken system. Okay, so that's, that's kind of the first step. So usually the next step is to, to have a test machine, to have like a guinea pig box. Uh, you run your, your, your kernels on there, you test your code on there, and if it crashes, that's fine, because who cares, you, you can just reboot it. Um, the problem once you do that is now you have to figure out how am I going to quickly deploy my, my kernel into my, uh, into my guinea pig? Um, how am I going to get my output out? How am I going to automate this? Um, if you're working with a real board, say you're working on an ARM board or something, you may have to power cycle it or do things like that, which can also be annoying. So um, these are some of the challenges. And the, the other one is if you have two machines, now you've got two machines to worry about, if you want to hack on something while you're traveling, while you're on a train or on an airplane or whatever, while you're offline, you might not be able to do that. So um, these are some of the, 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 the drawbacks of isolating it and using two machines. By the way, feel free to, to interrupt me or ask questions. There's a million different development cycles and ways to do it. So if while I'm talking, I, I, I kind of mention something and, and, and you have another approach that you want to share with us, then you know, please speak up and we can, we can chat about it. OK, so virtual machines. So you can kind of get the best of both worlds, of having a separate isolated environment that can crash and die and it's not going to bring everything down. But you can take it with you, right? You can, you can have it on your, your laptop. You're not tied to any external infrastructure. You can be hacking while you're offline or while you're on a plane or whatever. Um, if you have a virtual machine, they're easy to start and stop. You're just starting a program, stopping a program. You also have great debugging because you can inspect what's going on in there. Uh, another cool thing is if you use an emulator like QEMU, you can actually do cross-architecture development. So say you have a, a little ARM uh, board that you're developing for, um, but you have an x86 laptop. You can still do that using an emulation. Uh, and the final thing is your hardware is programmable. So that means if you need to add custom devices, you could write code to add custom devices, and then you can do all the things like error injection. OK. OK, so I actually have a section about that at the end. It's kind of one of the advanced things you can do, but there are some good reasons to do that, and people have been doing that. So uh, I'll, I'll introduce that a little bit. Um, OK, so yeah, so let me introduce QEMU. A lot of you are probably familiar with it. Uh, it's an emulator. Uh, it supports uh, 17 CPU architectures, has a bunch of really obscure ones, soft cores and things that are not used very uh, widely but it also has the main ones. And the main ones are also the most solid ones because that's where most of the people have been contributing, fixing bugs. And so they're, they're fairly solid. x86, ARM, PPC. There's also you know, MIPS and, and, and other development going on. Um, this is one of the nice things about QEMU is that it has this critical mass. It has a community of people contributing new devices and new architectures. And it means that if you use QEMU today, uh, say you're working on, on, on an ARM project, uh, chances are tomorrow if you need to work on a, a MIPS project or something like that, you won't need to throw it out, learn new tools. You can probably keep using it because it just has this wide community you know, of pe people who are using it for different uh, tasks. And it runs on Linux, Mac, BSD, Windows. I would say that the home kind of environment is Linux. That's where you get the best feature palette and, and the best performance. But it certainly also runs on, on other host operating systems. Um, it, it's not just an emulator, it also supports the hardware virtualization features that modern CPUs have. And basically what that means is you can run guest code, you can run get code in your virtual machine natively on the CPU in a secure manner um, so that you don't need to do emulation for all the instructions. And of course that makes it a lot faster because you no longer have a software loop that's translating the instructions. Instead the CPU on the host is actually running them. And it's open source. OK, so just to give you a, a mental model of what it's like to run QEMU, to have a virtual machine, basically QEMU is a user space process 
Inside there, it allocates a, a block of memory that it will use as the physical RAM for the virtual machine. And it also has all the device state. So the CPU registers, if it's emulating a network card, you know, the network card registers and all of that. Uh, but what happens is when the uh, virtual machine tries to access some hardware, um, it basically traps into the emulator, and the emulator will then um, perform whatever operation um, you know, that network card or that disk storage controller is doing. Uh, so the QME user space process just does I.O. on behalf of the guest. So there's still a host kernel. There's still Linux underneath. Uh, and QME is a user space process. And say the virtual machine tries to access the disk, um, QME will just do a, a read or a write or an F data sync or whatever system call is, is necessary to do that on behalf of the guest. OK, so the way QME works is that it, it's split out into different binaries. Um, so for example, you have QME system ARM for all the ARM <coughs> machines. And inside that binary, it supports a list of different machine types. So these machine types are basically the different boards. So if you have a different types of ARM boards, some of them might be configured with slightly different CPUs, different sets of hardware, uh, network cards, and various things like that. Um, so for, for most of this presentation, I just kind of gloss over this and I just focus on x86. But all of this kind of applies to cross-architecture stuff as well. Um, the, the only thing to be aware of is that if you do do cross-architecture development, especially now that like the ARM multi-core boards are getting faster and faster, it's no longer easy to say, oh, don't worry, ARM is slow and we can always emulate it very quickly on x86. Um, you know, you, can, you will notice the overhead. So whenever you have virtualization support, use it because it will be faster. OK, so the very basics, how do we launch a virtual machine? This is how you launch a, a simple x86 virtual machine with a gig of RAM and two CPU cores. Um, this doesn't have any disks. It has some default hardware. It has like a network card. It, it does have an IDE controller. But uh, since we haven't given it a disk image, doesn't have anything to boot from. So what's, what's going to happen is you're just going to see uh, the BIOS booting up. And then you see the Pixie boot ROM desperately trying to boot off the network because there were no disks. And it's not going to go anywhere either because we haven't configured any network boot. So the next step is how do we load a kernel, right? We, we want to use this for kernel development. We want to be able to test our kernels in there. Um, so there are some command line options that are very similar to like a grub command line or something like that. You can drop in a kernel. You can point it at a kernel file. You can point it at an init ramfs. And you can add kernel parameters from the command line. And when you do this, what happens is that QME does a slightly different boot process for the virtual machine. And it loads the kernel into memory. It loads the init ramfs. And it sets up the same environment that grub or a bootloader would do if it had booted from a disk. And then jumps to the kernel entry point. And this way, you can take just files that you have laying around on, on your host outside where you compiled your kernel, and you can pass them right into the virtual machine. Uh, so that's quite convenient. Um, and one thing I forgot to mention is that if you're working on device drivers, you might be thinking, well, this is nice, but all these devices are emulated. So if I'm doing driver development, how do I do driver development with, with QEMU? Because you know, I need to have PCI device access or whatever. And there is a PCI pass-through. There is device assignment that you can use. Uh, and I've used it a couple times. It even has some useful features, like you can trace the, the hardware register accesses. So um, you can trace the actual you know, MMIO bars or whatever that you're talking to in your driver. You can get a log of that, which is, which is quite handy, too. So you can actually use it for developing device drivers, not just for running code in a completely contained environment. You just pass the hardware through. OK, so we know how to run a kernel. But uh, how do we use that for actually running any real interesting tests and, and things that we want to do for, for drivers that we're developing? We obviously need to put some kind of scripts and, and programs and files into the virtual machine that are going to run, that are going to, you know, for example, if you're working on a network device, you probably want to bring up the network card. Maybe you want to do DHCP, run some benchmarks or whatever. Uh, so we need a way to kind of populate uh, a file system. And as long as you keep your, your tests fairly simple and small, you can just shove it all into an init ramfs. Uh, that's a very easy way. You know, just pack everything into an init ramfs. You have a little file system. It has all your tests and scripts. 
And you just kick it off from slash init. You don't even need to use you know, an init system. You don't need system D or, or whatever if you just want to do one simple test for, of a driver. Um, and the cool thing about this is that you can, you can do this extremely quickly. The, the time to do a kernel compile and then to, to launch that init ramfs and, and get feedback and see what your code is doing is very, very short. It's just a matter of a few seconds. Mm -hmm. So it's a very quick development cycle. It's a very good pace. Um, basically, you just rebuild that init ramfs every time you compiled your kernel modules. Uh, and here's a little bit of a breakdown in practice how you do that. So you could you take your kernel image, you can, you can pass that to QMU, and then you combine... Your, your test scripts and things like that, pack them into an init ramfs. Kernel modules, if you're not using a modular kernel, uh, sorry, a, a monolithic kernel. Um, and in order to get environment, I find that the, the simplest thing to use is just BusyBox because it's a statically linked program that supports kind of mini versions of LS, bin SH, and all the standard utilities. So if you throw that into your init ramfs, um, you, you basically have a common minimal Linux environment that you can use. Okay, so getting a little bit more practical how to actually do this. Um, the Linux source tree has, has a bunch of utilities for building uh, init ramfs's and you, if you want you can even inline them into the kernel image itself. Uh, or you can keep them separate in a separate file like an init ramfs file. Uh, and the utility that does this is gen init cpio. It just takes a description file, and that description file just tells it which files from the host to copy into the init.ramfs, what permissions to give them, and so on. You can create directories, you can create device nodes, you can create symlinks, and all the things you need. So you give it a little description file, which basically describes your root file system. Um, and that's how you build your uh, init.ramfs. And this is included in the Linux source tree. So actually, if you have a Linux kernel laying around right now, um, that's there, and it's built, and it's ready to, to be used. Okay, so as a kind of summary of this whole process, if you want to try it out, uh, you know, you build your kernel. I just put one make command line that I had just to build a few modules I was working on. Um, and then you, you build your, your init ramfs, and then you can launch it with QMU like this. Um, I have, I have added something new here that I haven't explained before, and that's uh, the serial port. So although you can use a, a QMU GUI, which, which is like a GTK user interface, um, usually for development it's easier to just use the serial port because then you can get all the text out onto your, into your terminal, you can copy paste it and, and, and all of that. Uh, so you can just configure it to use the, the serial console. Um, and that's really it. So if, if, if you have this little recipe here, um, this gives you a very, very quick development cycle. And I, I find that it's kind of useful for 80% of the kind of driver development stuff that I do. The other 20% are the cases where um, things are more complicated, where the stuff you want to run inside your virtual machine has a lot of dependencies. Once you have dynamically linked programs, not like BusyBox, um, in order to do this, you have to then run LDD, find out what dependencies they have, and copy in the, the shared libraries in order for them to be able to run. And that becomes a pain. Um, other things, other things uh, that are bad about this approach is that um, if you, you're just copying in files from your host file system, they come from your Linux distro. So whatever you're running underneath, if you're running Fedora, if you're running Debian or Ubuntu or whatever. Um, so over time, if you're, if you're working on something for a long time, you keep rerunning this script, you might find that files have changed names or moved around because versions change or whatever, and this breaks your process. So this is all like a, a little bit fiddly if you have a more complicated init ramfs that you're working on. So for that, I wouldn't recommend it. Um, and at that point, it's time to move on to a real root file system. Um, and with that, I mean a, a persistent root file system where you have a full Linux distro um, and you can just keep your files there. Um, there are also other tools. Basically, the choice you have at this point is, do you want to install a normal Linux distro? Do you want to de-bootstrap you know, just a Debian, for example, into a directory? Uh, or do you want to use a tool like BuildRoot, which lets you build a whole bunch of um, user space tools from source and install them into a, a tree? Um, and, and basically, you can either use a disk image file. QMU will take a, an image file name, like a raw 
file that has the contents of a disk, so like a partition table and all that stuff. Uh, and that's nice because you can just easily use uh, 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 an install ISO from any Linux distro and you can install a virtual machine. Uh, or the other thing is you can share a directory. So if you want to be able to access that directory from the host, that's quite nice too because when you compile your kernel modules, you can just copy them into that directory. Um, you don't have to fiddle around with the disk image. Uh, QMU supports, uh, I mean, you could use NFS, for example, to share directories. And QMU also supports uh, Verdeo 9P, which is a, uh, like a file sharing protocol. Um, okay. So I'm going to move on to, to debugging virtual machines, um, unless anyone wants to talk about or has questions about building little virtual machines for, for testing. Go ahead. I have a question regarding the machine using the virtual machine. Yeah. Mm. And I use the farm uh, for the Wi-Fi system because in fact the kernel supports a lot of things for NFS and then uh, the new farm is accessible. Yes. And this way I, am, I feel the best of both worlds because I can have uh, two different new farm inside and depending on what I want to test. Yeah. And uh, I still have uh, my modules that in the kernel so I don't have to worry with the stuff that is already inside and I don't have to maintain it. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so, so that's a that's that's a nice idea. You can you can combine approaches. Um, I just remember that I, I can't remember. I think QMU does also support concatenating in at RamFS's. Um, so you can do that if you want to stage different layers of. I have some modules here. I have some tools here, and you want to mix and match. You can concatenate them. Um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so let's move on to something a little different. So uh, if you have a virtual machine and you want to debug it, um, usually the things you want to do is you want to do things like inspecting memory or registers, CPU registers, getting back traces, or maybe setting breakpoints um, and stepping code, things like that. So QMU supports GDB remote debugging. So you can attach to a virtual machine. And what you see in there is you see, instead, so in user space, if, say you're debugging Firefox or something, you would see all the threads. And each one of those threads obviously would have a backtrace and CPU state and everything. When you debug a virtual machine, what you see is you see threads, but every thread is a CPU. So every thread is a, the virtual machine's CPU. So it's just like on an SMP system, you have eight cores or whatever. Then when you debug it, you will see eight threads, but these are the CPUs. Um, so that's really what, what you can do. Um, and KGDB is not required in order to do this because the GDB stub, the, the server that allows GDB to connect and attach to the virtual machine, isn't located inside the guest kernel. It's actually located inside QEMU. Um, so that means that this is, this is non-invasive. In fact, you can use it to debug firmware. You could use it to debug bootloaders. You could use it to debug Windows or, or whatever, right? It, it's, it doesn't depend on you having KGDB built into the kernel that you're trying to debug. So that's, that's an advantage. Um, there's a common confusion when people try to debug their virtual machines. Sometimes people try to attach GDB to the QMU user space process. And they don't see anything useful in there. Because when you do that, what you're seeing is you're seeing the internals of QMU itself. So QMU is a C program. So obviously it has its own data structures and things that represent the virtual machine and know how to access the memory and all of that. Um, and trying to debug QMU itself in order to get into the guest, it's possible theoretically, but because there are layers of you know, data structures and things you need to navigate through, it's a pain. It's not really the, the, the right way to do it. If you're trying to debug the virtual machine, the right thing to do is to use QMU's remote debugging feature. It's GDB stuff. Um, and just, just as a reminder of how remote debugging in GDB even works, GDB has a ptrace backend by default you know, on Linux where it can use syscalls to attach to processes, but, it, but it's modular. It also has a remote protocol backend that it can use. And that's, 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 that's a stream protocol. You can run it over serial, you can run it over a network or a pipe or whatever. And um, it basically allows a GDB client to send commands to a GDB stub server 
Uh, and that server then parses those commands and it does whatever it's been asked to do. It, it might, may have been asked to set a breakpoint. It may have been asked to read memory or things like that. And that's what QMU has. It has a GDB stuff. And that will then go and it will manipulate the guest state in order to do what you want to do in your debugger. So here's how you actually do it. Here are the commands. So the only new thing that I've really introduced is the dash s option in QMU. That's the shorthand. There's a longer option, a longer GDB option where you can specify which port number to listen on and all this stuff. But usually just the dash s is enough because it binds to port 1234, TCP port 1234 on localhost. Then you go into your GDB and I think a lot of GDBs that are shipping now actually are multi-arch. I think they support, you know, you could debug ARM from them, you can debug. So it's a good idea to set the architecture because the GDB client, before it's connecting, it doesn't know what do you want to talk to, what machine do you want to talk to. So if you tell it the architecture, then it, it will be able to interpret the, the, re the register contents and the packets properly. Uh, if you don't do this, what usually happens is you get an error message saying something like response was too long or whatever, because maybe it thought you were talking to this type of processor and then it received a register dump for a different type of processor and gets confused. Okay, so you set the architecture. Then you can load symbols files, it's optional. Of course, you can debug without symbols if you want, but uh, here I'm loading the VM Linux ELF file that has all the kernel, core kernel symbols in them so that I can get a backtrace with function names. Um, and then you say target remote to, um, to actually connect to the GDB sub. So if I, I go back a slide, the target remote command tells the GDB client connect to the QMU GDB stub over you know, TCP port 1234. Um, so now you're in a GDB session and you see the virtual machine. So, now, so I did a backtrace and you, know, you can see that this, this CPU is in the kernel and it's idling, it's just sleeping. Um, okay. There are a couple of caveats with this um, because GDB is kind of mostly used for, for user space debugging. The way some of these things map to debugging a kernel and debugging a virtual machine um, need a little bit of explaining. So um, the first thing is that generally your memory addresses, when you're printing out addresses and doing stuff, they're all virtual addresses for whatever MMU configuration the current CPU has. So it will, it will use whatever you know, MMU settings you have right now in order to, to, to access that memory. Uh, so that depends, of course, whether you're in real mode on x86 or you have paging set up and, and all these kinds of things. Um, so that, that can be confusing, um, but it, it does make sense. And that's kind of the same thing as you get when you're debugging in user space, right? You, you're seeing the virtual addresses um, that the process sees. Um, another thing is that GDB isn't really aware of your kernel. It doesn't know anything that Linux is doing. It doesn't know about swap. So if you try to access an address, for example, if you happen to break into a user space process in user mode, and you try to access a random address that is in the virtual memory space, maybe it's not there because it's, it's swapped out or whatever. So, um, you know, you could, you could hit that. So because you're debugging below the OS, you don't have the niceties that you do when you're debugging a normal user space process. You just need to be aware of this. And for kernel debugging, that's fine because the Linux kernel is not paged out, right? The Linux kernel is always fully mapped. Um, and the final, the final thing which can be confusing when you do this is that you should tell GDB which sub-architecture you're debugging. So say you're debugging um, x86, that's really not enough. You might be in real mode if you're debugging BIOS or a bootloader or something like that. You might be in 32-bit mode, you might be in 64-bit mode. So GDB will get confused if you try to debug and you haven't told it the exact sub-architecture mode that you're in. Um, so that's just another thing to be aware of. But besides that, yeah, please go ahead. Yes, yes, yeah, yeah. And uh, I think another way to think about this is, is imagine you have a raw binary file and it has some machine code in it. You try to obj dump it. You have to tell obj dump which architecture do you want to disassemble for because otherwise it doesn't know. It's the same. I'm pretty sure it does, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that was the end of um, debugging. Uh, virtual machines. So the next topic I'm going to talk about is using QMU to do device bring up. Um, so this is related to the question that we had earlier. Um, can you add your own devices? 
So QEMU supports a whole bunch of built-in devices that people have contributed over the years, things like serial ATA, AHCI controller, or the Intel E1000 network card, and just popular devices. Um, but Sometimes when you're doing driver development, um, you hit problems like the real hardware isn't even available yet. You have a spec. Maybe you know some guy in a lab somewhere who has access to this new piece of hardware, but you don't have it. So you can't uh, easily develop your code or you can't easily test it. Um, or maybe the hardware is just expensive and it, it's not going to be feasible to get hold of enough hardware for your, for your whatever lab kind of situation you have for the machines that you want to be running on. The other thing is sometimes hardware and software co-development, when people are kind of iterating and sketching out the hardware-software boundary, you can do some of that by adding a device, to, a custom device to QEMU. Um, so this is really what you do. You, you implement a custom device emulation in QEMU. Then you can develop a driver against it, and you can already test your driver. And then finally, when you get the real hardware, you can test your code that's already ready. Uh, against the real hardware to verify it and make sure that it, it's actually doing what it's supposed to be doing because you don't know if, you know, maybe you made a mistake when you implemented the spec or maybe the hardware folks made a mistake when they implemented the spec. Um, but actually people have been doing this. So um, there are a couple of examples recently. The NVMe, the Intel NVMe uh, flash storage uh, controller interface that, that, that's fairly recent. Uh, they contributed the QEMU patches, and you could already test all the code and run it inside a virtual machine, even though you didn't have the hardware, the real hardware. Um, same story for NVDIMM persistent memory. There are patches now um, that people are using to already develop stuff, even though they don't have real persistent memory hardware. Um, yeah, and, and, then, and then there's also this Rocker open flow network switch, which is kind of a, a virtual device for stuff that was added to the Linux kernel, and they wanted to have a device that they could test their interfaces and prove their ideas against. So they added this, and they you know, came up with a spec for a virtual device, and they added it to QEMU, and they were able to develop their kernel code, and their code is merged, the, I think, net device switch operations code in the kernel. So there are definitely some, you know, there's precedents for doing this kind of stuff. And basically what it entails is, you write some C code in QEMU to emulate a device. Um, and just like the kernel, when you write device drivers, there's already a lot of common code for PCI or USB and stuff. You don't need to, to write all of that from scratch. Instead, you just say, I'm writing a PCI device, and you focus on just the tasks that is un are unique to your device, um, not the general PCI housekeeping and all of that. So we have a similar kind of framework in QEMU. Uh, the only other thing worth mentioning here is that QEMU is a functional emulator. It just tries to act like the real device. It's just emulating. It's not a cycle accurate simulator or anything. It's not simulating the hardware down to the lowest level of detail. Um, you know, we skip a lot of things because we're just doing it in software. So for example, even for the CPU that's being emulated, we don't emulate the cache and the cache lines and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, and sometimes people want to do real hardware design in software together with QEMU. And there's no, there's no mainline solution for doing that, but there are some out-of-tree solutions for actually doing hardware simulation. So not writing a device in C, but actually using hardware design tools and merging it with QEMU, connecting the two worlds. Um, I don't know much about it, but if that's the kind of thing you're after, it exists, and, and you, can, you can find out more information. So, so that's, that, that, that's a, a good question. So what about timing, right? Because sometimes, sometimes a hardware spec will say, you know, you have to read this register, you have to wait for 250 microseconds or whatever before you read it, otherwise it might not be ready yet. Um, and in some cases, QEMU um, has code, has timers and things like that that make sure that we can honor those timings. In other cases, QEMU kind of skips them and is just instantly available, even though a real hardware device wouldn't be like that. Um, so it's certainly possible that you could have bugs where your driver is happy with QEMU and is not happy with real hardware. Yeah, you could have bugs like that. But um, 
if, if you plan for that and you code for it, you can simulate it. So when it matters, we do, we do simulate those kinds of timings. Right. Yes. Yeah, exactly. So you do have this risk. But I think the reason why people do this bring up um, is because then the hardware and software teams can, can work in parallel. So it will reduce their time to market. Um, but of course, if things are very, very specific and very low level, there's no way of, of, of doing it in software and then hoping it will work in hardware. OK. So. Uh, I'm sorry? Yeah, yeah. So one of the one of the weaknesses that QMU as a project has is we don't have a lot of documentation. But we have a lot of code examples. So uh, there's tons, there's there are a lot of devices available that you can look at. Right, they're just in the source tree. Um, they're the best way to learn. Um, and I'm I'm really impressed, you know, the people who contributed some of these devices I mentioned. I'm not sure if they contributed to QMU before. They just one day showed up on the mailing list, sent patches, and they were really high quality. They figured everything out by themselves. Maybe I guess they had some contacts or some help, but yeah. So the examples are there. <clears throat> okay, and I'll just give you a little bit of a flavor so you can understand what it's like to develop your own custom device in QMU. So basically, there is a there is a device model, kind of similar to how the kernel device driver. Um, you know, framework also has uh, a model. So QMU has a kind of object-oriented model that everything is written in C. Um, so for example, here if we have an Intel E1000 NIC, uh, you can see that there is, there is a hierarchy. It basically derives from a base class for these NICs because they have various quirks and features. So there's a few different types of E1000 NICs that we support. And then the base class says, I'm a PCI device, so it inherits a bunch of functionality there. And then at the final step, it's a device, which has some core functionality that all devices have. Um, so this way, you would, you would kind of, if you had a PCI device, you would just create a new type of object, and it would be your, you know, your unique device, and it would be a PCI device. The way you hook into the emulation is you define uh, memory regions. Um, and you basically just tell QMU how big the memory region is. These are the hardware registers that the, the driver will be writing, reading and writing from. Uh, and you give callback functions, a read and a write function, that will be invoked whenever the virtual machine tries to access your device. And this is where you implement your emulation. So this is where you can say, okay, they were trying to access this hardware register. Now I need to do some behavior to, to simulate that. Um, and that's, that's the main part of, 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 of how you hook into the emulation. Of course, there are interrupts. And usually, the bus that you're using provides the, the infrastructure for doing that. So if you're PCI, you, know, you, you have a function to raise interrupts uh, you know, to notify the host about events. And then QMU has the, all the, the rest of the stuff. You don't need to implement you know, all the generic stuff that happens, like the interrupt controller that, uh, uh, of course, the virtual machine is, is accessing. And, um, so, so, that, so that's how it works. There's obviously a lot more to implementing device emulation in QMU that I, you know, it's not really relevant to this presentation. But all the examples are in the hardware directory in QMU. And, um, you know, feel free to post RFC patches if you want feedback or if you want help. Um, and every year, QMU gets more and more device models for, for, for various hardware. So, um, so let us know if, you know, if, if, if you want to do that. The final thing that I'm going to talk about is error injection. Uh, this is kind of interesting because when you have real hardware, it can be hard to trigger some error cases in drivers. And maybe not even in drivers, but also in volume managers, file systems, and network stacks, or whatever. Um, because some of these error cases are things that will only happen if the hardware goes very, very wrong. Um, and doing that in real life might mean, I don't know, might mean overheating your hardware. It might mean pulling out cables while it's running or weird things like that. And although there are some tricks to do that in real life on physical hardware, um, 
it's of course much, much easier to do it in software. And that's exactly what QME does, because it gives you all these emulated devices, which you could modify if you want to go in there and hack them to make them do things. Um, so the very simplest example that I thought of was just what happens if I try to hot unplug a device while it's still in use, right? There might be some DMA still going on, some I.O. requests still pending, and now we, we, we unplug it. So you, you can do these kinds of things um, very easily in software that might not be... You might not be able to automate them physically, right? How do you automate unplugging a uh, physical PCI card? Uh, but you can do it in software. There's more interesting stuff, though. There's more advanced stuff you can do. So in the QMU block layer, we, um, we have an error injection engine, which, which is pretty neat. Um, it's basically a state machine where you can, um, you can, you can tell it certain conditions when, when you want to, instead of allowing the request to proceed, the I.O. request to proceed, instead, if that condition is matched, you can inject an error. Um, and because it has a state machine, you could do complex things, like you could say, only trigger the error on the third request uh, that, that is submitted and not on every single request and things like that. So, so if you look at this little script, it will fail all disk read requests, but only after the first write request. So for example, if your bootloader is booting up, it can still read the boot partition because that's, we haven't done any writes yet. But once the first write request happens, it transitions to state number two. And then once state number two is there, um, you know, when, when the next read happens, then we'll inject uh, EIO that will fail the request. So there's documentation on how to use this, but I can imagine you could do weird things, that things that are hard to test uh, on real hardware, and not just in the actual storage controller driver, like your serial ATA controller, but maybe other things like your volume manager or, you know, partition code or file systems. Um, so that's there as well. So you can use QMU to put your hardware into weird states, and because of that, you're going to be able to trigger code paths that are very hard to, to trigger otherwise. All right, so that's the end of my slides. Um, are there any questions? Are there any topics people want to talk about? Yeah. So, I think that we don't have a way of doing that. Um, I can't remember. I think maybe someone hacked it, that if you send like SIG user 2 or something, then it transitions to a state, but that's just a special case one-off hack. I don't think we have a generic way of doing it, but it wouldn't be too hard to add a, a monitor command. So QMU has a, a monitor, like a, a remote console that you can use to, to, to send it commands while it's running. You could add a monitor command that would then tweak this. Now, the problem with this is it's specific to QMU's block layer. It doesn't affect all devices. Only storage devices will be able to take advantage of this error injection engine. But I wanted to show it because it's something that you can really use uh, in many places if you want to apply it for other device types. Um, I mean, it, it would be possible to do that. Uh, I'm not sure if it's easy to do that today, because I don't know if, if QMU actually emulates that state. Um, but absolutely, it should be possible. Uh, I mean, maybe even in a really primitive way, like just removing those memory regions that have been registered so that everything is just FFFF if you read it back. Well, you have the GDB um, remote protocol. So any tool that speaks the GDB protocol can be used. So if there's any GDB client tools that you like that, that are graphical, yes, then you can use them and they will be compatible. But uh, QME itself doesn't have a memory inspection tool. It does have a few um, commands which I haven't mentioned in my slides. You can do a few things. You can dump out memory. So then you can export it and just put it into hex editor or whatever you like. But I think it also has tools, I think it also has maybe a command or two that allow you to search memory, I can't remember. So th there are some possibilities there. 
Uh, I'm sorry? Uh, which host OS? Uh, which host OS are you asking about? Oh, Mac. Yeah, yeah. QMU does run on Mac. Um, it's not. It's not the most actively kind of supported platform. We make sure that the compile never breaks um, because the maintainer, the guy who the, the guy who takes care of QMU.git merging patches, he runs on Mac OS. So he makes sure that it never breaks and that the basic tests run. However, I think that macOS doesn't have all the same optimizations that the Linux QEMU has. So um, it might not be as fast. And on Mac, for example, you don't have KVM. So that means you're always going to be using the just-in-time compiler to emulate, and it's a slower than using hardware virtualization. Um, and it's actually interesting because recently Apple released, I forget what it's called, VM Kit or something like that. It's a framework on macOS that allows you to write a hypervisor because it ex exposes the VMX uh, instructions uh, through uh, an API. So in theory, someone could work on that and could implement a KVM equivalent on macOS easily now without introducing a new kernel driver because Apple doesn't want people to write kernel drivers as much anymore, right? They want to get your app in the App Store or whatever. You know, so. Yeah. So I'm not I'm not aware uh, of Linux kernel tests, but I'm sure that people uh, are doing it because there, there are plenty of, of users. Um, so if you think about um, you know, there are plenty of projects that, that use QMU. Uh, there are also some forks of QMU, like the Android emulator, for example. Um, and they have tests, right? So, so yes, there must be, there must be uh, lots of testing going through QMU. Okay, thank you very much.